All right, I invite you to turn in your Bibles to Psalm 2. Psalm chapter 2. Last week we looked at Psalm 1. This week we're looking at Psalm 2. This is the stage before we get into our our, uh, Advent series in the Psalms. Follow along with me as I read for us Psalm 2, beginning in verse 1. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree the Lord has said to me, You are my son, today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now, therefore, O kings, be wise, be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way. For his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. May God bless the reading of his word. In many countries around the world, uh, Christians are being persecuted for their faith in Jesus Christ. I believe very aptly drew our attention to that this, this morning in the prayer time. There are whole organizations dedicated to persecution awareness, being the, the eyes and ears of the world and Countries hostile to Christianity. Uh, According to one such organization, Open Doors International, every month 5,621 Christians are killed, 2,110 churches are attacked, and 4,542 Christians are detained. Governments, politicians, spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places, They do their best to silence the good news of Jesus Christ. But such has been the case for God's people ever since the fall of mankind into sin, right? In Genesis 3, verse 15, the Lord said to Satan, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. So although God promised victory for the offspring of the woman, Satan would be able to inflict severe damage on God's people. It's no coincidence that the very next chapter has essentially an offspring of the serpent crushing an offspring of the woman. And you can say that much of Israel's history has been this very case. Uh, In 1 Samuel chapter 14, verse 47, for example, when Saul became king over Israel, it says that he fought against all his enemies on every side, against Moab, against the Ammonites, against Edom, against the kings of Zobah, and against the Philistines. And when David became king, it, it was no different. He defended Israel against those same nations and more. In the words of Psalm 2, verse 2, the kings of the earth did indeed set themselves against the Lord and his anointed, and they continue to do so today. In time, Israel became discouraged and disheartened. But they took heart in this, in this promise here in Psalm 2, which speaks of a new Davidic king who would be victorious in their battle with the kings of the earth. This psalm, you see, encouraged them to continue trusting 
in the Lord and in his anointed king. And just like the people of Israel, you know, persecuted believers today can draw on the strength and comfort that comes from the word of God. If we ever become disheartened or discouraged by the attacks on followers of Jesus Christ around the world, Psalm 2 can be, can be an encouragement to us to continue trusting in the Lord and in his anointed king. And so with that groundwork in place, let us look now at our text. Psalm 2 consists of four stanzas of three verses each. Stanza 1 describes how the kings of the earth rebel against the Lord and his anointed. Look at verse 1. The psalmist asks, why do the nations rage and the people's plot in vain? When a new king was crowned in the ancient world, other nations thought that to be an opportune time to rebel against the untested king. We see this, for example, in 1 Kings chapter 12, when Rehoboam succeeded his father, King Solomon, and the ten northern tribes of Israel rebelled and, and selected Jeroboam as their king. What we see here is the enmity, to borrow the language of Genesis 3 verse 15, between the offspring of the serpent and the offspring of the woman. Psalm 2 is, is picturing for us these, these Gentile nations who do not worship the Lord, conspiring together and whose people are plotting rebellion against the Lord and his anointed. But the question that the psalmist asks is why? Why do they rage? Why do they plot? Why do they rebel? The, the, the psalmist carries over the, the why of verse 1 into verse 2. Why do the kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and his anointed? Why? Now we must understand this is not a rhetorical question. This is, this is a rhetorical question. The, the psalmist isn't surprised by the rebellion of the kings of the earth. No, the psalmist is surprised against whom the kings of the earth would dare to even attempt to rebel. And that is against the Lord and his anointed. The, the reference here to the Lord's anointed is, is initially a reference to the Davidic king. So a king from the line and house of David. In the Old Testament, kings were anointed to rule God's people on God's behalf. We see this in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 13, where it says that Samuel took the, the horn of oil and he anointed David in the midst of his brothers, and the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. And so the implication here is that the, the kings of the earth are raging, they're plotting, they're rebelling against the Lord and against the king of Israel. Now, since Psalm 1 and Psalm 2 go together, you know, it, it's like they are casting aside the instruction of the Lord. They, they don't want anything to do with the, the path of life that is found in, in delighting and, and meditating on the law of the Lord. They, they don't want the Lord and his anointed to rule over them. They want to do what seems right in their own eyes. But the response of the psalmist here is that to do so is vanity. It's, it's a lost cause to rebel against the king of the universe and his anointed king. And yet, overconfident in their ability to overthrow the king of the universe and the king of Israel, kings of the earth say in verse 3, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. Now, of course, the kings of the earth are not actually tied up with bonds and cords. These refer simply to being in subjection to the Lord and the king of Israel. However, the kings of the earth, they refuse to submit to the Lord and his anointed king. They, they do not want to be servants of God. They want to be free. They want to be independent. They want to be autonomous. Kind of like the, the wicked in Psalm 1. 
How does the Lord respond to this rebellion on the earth? In stanza two, the scene shifts to heaven where God dwells. Look at verse four. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Notice the stark contrast here between the kings of the earth and he who sits in the heavens. What we're seeing here is that the Lord is is highly exalted above all earthly powers. There's, There's no comparison there. There's no contest. Turn, turn over to Isaiah chapter 40. Uh, the prophet Isaiah helps to kind of put things into perspective. Isaiah chapter 40, we're going to begin reading in verse 15. Prophet Isaiah writes, Behold, the nations are like a drop from a bucket and are counted as the dust on the scales. Behold, he takes up the coastlands like fine dust. Lebanon would not suffice for fuel, nor are its boasts enough for a burnt offering. All the nations are as nothing before him. They are accounted by him as less than nothing and emptiness. There's the the vanity, that word vanity, emptiness. Verse 22 It is he who sits above the circle of the earth and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them like a tent to dwell in, who brings princes to nothing and makes the rulers of the earth as emptiness. Do you think there's a comparison here? Maybe they're kind of close in similarity. No. Who do the kings of the earth think they are to even contemplate rebellion against the kings of the earth, the king, king of the universe? Uh, one commentator writes this about God's laughter. He writes, in a strange way, it is one of the most assuring sounds in the whole Psalter, as it relativizes even the largest of human claims for ultimate control over the affairs of people and nations. The fiercest terror is made the object of laughter and derision and thus is rendered impotent to frighten those who hear the laughter of God in the background. In other words, the the laughter of God drowns out even the fiercest sounds of terror. Should be an encouragement. But then in verse 5, God's laughter turns to anger. Here's where the kings of the earth should be afraid. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury. So throughout scripture, we see the, the wrath of God on display in the, the worldwide flood. The destruction of of Sodom and Gomorrah, the defeat of the Egyptians, the suppression of the rebellion of Korah, the Assyrian destruction of the northern kingdom of Israel, the, the Babylonian destruction of the southern kingdom of Judah. We see it in the New Testament, the anger of Jesus at the money changers in the temple. And, and finally, in the eternal judgment of the lake of fire. In the Chronicles of Narnia, when confronted with the idea of Aslan, the lion, who is a a picture of God, uh, Lucy asks, is he safe? And and Mr. Beaver replies, safe? Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he's good. He's the king, I tell you. Mr. Tumnus also says, he's wild, you know. He's not a tame lion. Hebrews 12, verse 25 says, Our God is a consuming fire. With all of this in the background, we would expect God's wrath against these rebel nations to be meted out in a similar way. But in verse 6, the Lord simply declares, As for me, I have set my king 
on Zion, my holy hill. That's it. That's, that's the wrath of God, the anger of God on display against these rebel nations. You know, will, will, will these words be enough to strike terror into the hearts of these kings of the earth? Well, it should. It should, because the king of the universe himself has given the Davidic king his power and authority. You know, if, if I were to send our son Liam to tell the rest of our kids to do something, it carries a whole lot more weight than if Liam goes of his own accord to tell them to do it. Right? In the second instance, he goes in his own power and authority, but in the first instance, he goes with my power and authority. So yes, yes, the kings of the earth should be stricken with terror that the king of Israel comes to them in the power and authority of Almighty God. In the third stanza, the scene shifts from heaven back to earth where the Davidic king now rehearses the Lord's decree. Here's what the Lord has said to me. He says, look at verse 7. I will tell of the decree the Lord said to me, you are my son, today I have begotten you. Well, that's an interesting phrase. What, what exactly is the king of Israel saying here? Because in Egypt, the, the Pharaoh was literally regarded as a son of God and was therefore a God himself. Is the king of Israel saying that he is a God and not a man? Well, if you turn over to 2 Samuel chapter 7, in 2 Samuel chapter 7, King David hints to the prophet Nathan of his desire to build a house for the Lord. And Nathan initially tells David to, to do all that is in, is in his heart. But, but then the word of the Lord comes to Nathan, uh, telling him that David's son, who would be Solomon, would in fact be the one to accomplish this task. In 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 13 to 16, uh, the Lord says, He, so this is a reference to David's son, He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. When he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of men, with the stripes of the sons of men. But my steadfast love will not depart from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away from before you. And your house, David, your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. So, so what the king of Israel is is alluding to here in Psalm 2 is the fact that as the Davidic king, he, he shares, he, he enjoys a privileged position with the Lord, right? The Lord is to him a father and he is to the Lord a son. There is this close relationship between the Lord and his Davidic king. But the king of Israel is still human, right? He's not, he is not a God. He is fully human, he is the son of God in the same way that Adam is called the son of God in the genealogy of Jesus in Luke 3, verse 38. On the day of his coronation, the king of Israel, uh, he became an Adam-like vice-regent who ruled on behalf of God himself and whose authority extended to the ends of the earth, kind of like, kind of like Adam. And, and we, we hear this as much in what the king is quoting of the Lord in verse 8, where he says, Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage, and the ends of the earth your possession. Right? So this is the Lord saying this to his anointed king. And so this, this language of uh, the nations being his heritage and, and the ends of the earth being his possession, that should immediately draw our attention to Adam who was to expand the borders of the garden, being fruitful and multiplying and filling the earth with those who were made in God's image. But what happened? Adam sinned. 
and he was expelled from the garden. And in fact, the serpent, Satan, in fact, took dominion. Right, but then, then you know, later on in Genesis, right, land was promised to Abraham. And eventually it was it was received by Israel at the conquest. And and, and so we're we're expecting Israel to be this this new Adam who is going to take possession of the ends of the earth. But then what happens? Like Adam, Israel sins, and they too are expelled from the land. And so we see that both Adam and and Israel, they fail to take possession of the ends of the earth so that the king of Israel is now this this Davidic king, this this anointed of the Lord, is now given this task of of taking possession of the ends of the earth. In in Psalm 72, verses 8 to 11, the Lord promises the king of Israel, may he have dominion from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. May desert tribes bow down before him and his enemies lick the dust May the kings of Tarshish and of the coastlands render him tribute. May the kings of Sheba and Seba bring gifts. May all kings fall down before him. All nations serve him. Yeah, that, that sounds like the king of the, the, the king of Israel's is being given the ends of the earth. The, the Lord further says to, to his anointed king in verse 9: You shall break them, that is the kings of the earth with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now now notice the contrast there between a rod of iron and a potter's vessel. In in ancient Egypt, the uh, the pharaoh would have the names of his enemies written on potter's vessels, and then he would smash the vessels. And and after it was broken into uh, numerous pieces, the the vessel could never be put back together again. And so the, the act of breaking the potter's vessel symbolized the Pharaoh's victory over his enemies. And so in a similar way, Psalm 2 is indicating that the Davidic king will smash the opposition and will in fact be victorious over the kings of the earth. There, there, there just won't be any contest. And so this brings us to stanza 4, which speaks directly to these rebellious kings. The psalmist now warns the the conspiring and and plotting rebels to serve the Lord and his anointed king. Because the king of the universe himself has given the Davidic king his power and authority to rule to the ends of the earth, the psalmist says in verse 10, Now therefore, O kings, be wise and be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Verse 12 continues. Kiss the son, lest he be angry, and you perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. In the ancient world, people would kiss the feet of a king as a sign of their homage and their submission to the king. And so, rather than plot against the Lord and against his anointed. The psalmist here is urging the kings of the earth to kiss the son, to submit themselves to him, to pay homage to him, lest the anger of the Lord come upon them. But then as a final encouragement, see, it doesn't it doesn't just end with anger. No, as a final encouragement, Psalm 2 ends where Psalm 1 began with a beatitude. At at, at the end of all this, the the encouragement is still for the kings of the earth and for all peoples. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. So not just the kings of the earth, but blessed, happy are all who take refuge in the Lord and in his anointing. Right? That's, That's what the psalmist is urging here. When, when we hear the word refuge, we, we should think of a shelter, right? For example, when, when people are threatened by bombs, they take refuge in a bomb shelter, right? 
I, I watched a, a short video this week uh, about this Christian couple. He's Jewish and she's Arab. And uh, they, they live in the United States, but they traveled back to Israel to be with their families and to bring the provisions. And they said that when they were, when they touched down in Israel, they saw all of these signs wherever they went pointing the way to, to shelter. So it's like, here's the nearest shelter that you can go if, you know, there, there's a, an oncoming, in, an incoming missile, that kind of thing. And, and that can be a bit unnerving, right? When you hear bombs going off in the distance, right? It can be easy to become afraid and discouraged. Yet this Christian couple took refuge in the Lord. And I think the, the same principle applies to us today. You know, when we are threatened by the powers of this world, when we are tempted to, to be afraid and discouraged by the persecution of, of hundreds of millions of followers of Jesus all around the world, Psalm 2 encourages us to take refuge in the Lord, to, to trust in the Lord, to submit ourselves to the Lord. Because that, at the end of the day, that's, that's where our hope is found. Right? Blessed, happy are all who take refuge in the King of the universe. And so when, when Israel first heard this psalm, because we, we, we have to think first, because how did Israel first understand Psalm 2 before we can apply it to our lives? And when Israel first heard this psalm, they, they would have heard the, the message that the Lord in his battle with the kings of the earth will eventually and inevitably gain worldwide victory through his Davidic king, through a, a future king of David, or son of David, who would be king. And this message, it would have encouraged them to, to not give up, but to continue to trust in the Lord. Even when pagan nations attacked them, they could be assured of the Lord's victory, his, his inevitable victory. Yet even at its peak, Israel never reached to the ends of the earth, right? The king of Israel never did actually get to, to possess the ends of the earth. Even when Israel was at rest from all of its enemies in the days of Solomon, the rule of the Davidic king stretched from the Euphrates to the land of the Philistines and to the border of Egypt. That's 1 Kings 4, verse 21. And from there, Israel gradually declined, right? In, in 721 BC, Assyria captured the northern kingdom of Israel, and then in the year 586 BC, the Babylonians conquered the, the southern kingdom of Judah. And so when there were no more Davidic kings left, Israel had to, had to begin to understand this psalm differently. And, and see, they now looked at a future anointed king, a, a Messiah, a spirit-anointed, a spirit-empowered deliverer of God's people who would rule the world. That's, that's what they now looked forward to. And in fact, after the exile, the editor of the Psalter intentionally placed this psalm after Psalm 1 as a way of introducing the, the Psalter and as a way of saying, look in the following psalms for the coming Messiah King who is going to rule to the ends of the earth. This is what you can expect of him. And throughout the, the rest of, of the psalms, you, you see the, the Messiah, this, this Davidic King prophesied about. And so when Jesus comes onto the scene, we shouldn't be surprised that Psalm 2 is quoted or alluded to more than any other psalm because the New Testament authors understood Jesus to be the true Davidic king who perfectly fulfills all of what is said here of the Davidic king in Psalm 2. There is some differences between the Davidic king and, and Jesus, or Jesus perfectly fulfills this at least. While, while both the Davidic king and Jesus are indeed sons of God, Jesus is the literal son of God, conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. Right? The, the, the word who is in the beginning with God. Uh, Jesus' baptism, a voice from heaven. 
said, you are my beloved son. With you, I'm well pleased. It's Mark 1, verse 11. And at the transfiguration of Jesus, a voice from heaven again says, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. That's Mark 9, verse 7. And what we see is that in both of these instances, we, we hear the decree of the Lord, right? In, in, in Psalm 2, this is the Lord's decree. Here's the Lord's decree. Jesus is the anointed king through whom the Lord would gain worldwide victory over the nations. Therefore, listen to him. Submit to him. Obey him. Why? Because he comes in the power and authority of the king of the universe. Now, shockingly, Jesus would first suffer and die and be raised on the third day, right? That's, that's not exactly what you expect from a Messiah king. And yet, after his resurrection, Jesus told his disciples what? All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And then he tells his disciples, go, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Matthew 28, verses 18 to 20. And so unlike the king of Israel, who had a temporal kingdom here on earth, when Jesus ascended into heaven, he sat down at the right hand of the Father to rule over his eternal kingdom. In Ephesians chapter 1, verses 20 to 21, the Apostle Paul writes that God seated Christ at his right hand in the heavenly places far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And so though, though it is not visible to all yet right now, King Jesus rules over the nations. But, but it will become obvious at the end of the age when, when Jesus comes again, right? And we get a glimpse of that in Revelation 19. There the Apostle John uh, alludes to Psalm 2. Then I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. The one seated on it is called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems. And he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the word of God. And the armies of heaven arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. And he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So doesn't that just sound like Psalm 2? That's speaking about Jesus. Jesus is the true Davidic king who has come and is coming again to establish forever his dominion to the ends of the earth. You see, unlike the king of Israel, Jesus is not just king of the Jews. He is king of kings. There is no contest. Jesus will come again on that final day to judge the nations. One, one commentator writes, uh, Thus it is that the kingship of Christ calls other, all other kingships into question and places them under the lordship of Christ. In every sphere of life, Christ is the one who has ultimate rule over us. His kingship sets, up, sets us free from the fear of all lesser lords whom we may serve obediently and even willingly, who may cause us trouble and suffering, but who do not ultimately rule over us. The anointed of God alone claims and exercises that lordship. That lordship is the lordship of Christ. So now, how do we apply this to our lives? Well, Psalm 2 encourages the follower of Jesus Christ to continue to trust in the Lord and his anointed king, Jesus Christ, who will have victory over the evil powers in this world. We might 
as the, the, the quote earlier, we, we may serve obediently and willingly these, these lesser lords who cause us trouble and suffering, but, but Jesus Christ has dominion over them all. Now, now we shouldn't be surprised, should we, that, that Christians around the world still suffer persecution. We, we should not be surprised that, that we may have to suffer persecution. I mean, the, the Apostle Paul, uh, when, when he wrote to Timothy, he said, Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. That's 2 Timothy 3, verse 12. Now, Jesus also predicted persecution for his followers, but he called them what? Blessed. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, Matthew 5, verse 10. And so we see that the, the persecution is not stopping in, in many countries around the world, but neither are the Christians in those countries. And here's the encouragement, church. As the Apostle John wrote, the, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. John 1, verse 5. And the, the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. You see, the enemy wants us to believe that the kingdom of God is in retreat and, and that, that governments and, and politicians and, and the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places, that they, that they are somehow succeeding in their efforts in suppressing the church, but do not be dismayed. God is still moving and he is still providing opportunities for countless people to come to a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. Therefore, take courage, church. Take courage, for in the end, the king of the universe will gain worldwide victory through his Messiah King, Jesus Christ. Uh, Jesus said as much in, in John 16, verse 33, and he said, in the world you will have tribulation, right? In this world you will, you will face persecution and suffering. But take heart, Take courage. Why? Because I have overcome the world. So as we, as we make our way closer to Advent, may we remember this. This is Christ the King, whom shepherds guard and angels sing. Haste, haste to bring him laud, the babe, the son of Mary. Find refuge in him today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we look forward to the return of your son when he will usher in the messianic kingdom in all its fullness and when all things will be fully and finally restored. May his coming be soon. We thank you uh, that it was according to your good and gracious plan to incorporate Gentiles into your kingdom, that we could be saved by your grace through your gift of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray for the nations of the world that continue to rebel against you. You have made us in your image, yet there are many who deny you and despise the Messiah who is your son rather than their demise, we ask for your mercy to be upon them, that they might kiss the Son and find refuge in him. May our lives proclaim our Savior's love and inspire others to find their refuge in you alone. We pray, too, for our brothers and sisters in Christ around the world who are facing persecution for their faith in Jesus that you will keep them faithful to the end. And God, we pray for the Jewish people who have read this psalm and prayed this psalm and sung this psalm for many years, that the eyes of their hearts would be opened to see this psalm afresh, that they would believe in him of whom this psalm ultimately points, that they would believe in Jesus. For anyone here who has not bowed the knee to King Jesus, we pray that you would, by your spirit, urge them to do so today. We pray this 
the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.